there's always this big thing with these tech guys because they have a lot of money making these bold proclamations about what's going to happen nationwide when really their only worldview is their own little tiny bubble that is already an anomaly for the rest of the country. Yeah. Right. And he's saying like, you know, oh, all these $500 million office buildings, you know, all these like malls or whatever. I bet you that 90% of towns in the United States don't even have a $500 million office building. All right, guys, welcome to this episode of the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast. This is Wednesday, the Mike and Dan show, where I, Mike DeHaan, and my co-host here, Dan Austin, talk about real estate, investing, business, and everything in between. So happy, uh, what day is it, Tuesday we're recording this, but we have big news, and that is that real estate is officially melting down or going to melt down. I don't know, you're getting pretty fired up before we hopped on. You read some tabloid somewhere. You're probably waiting in line to check out at the, I don't know, Walgreens or wherever people your age go to buy things. You know, I don't go, I don't go to the grocery store, dude. <laughs> you know that. You're on the Instacart train these days. Is that what you do or you send your wife? I don't even do that. That's not even my thing. That's not my, um, what would you call that? It's not in my description here. That's not in my lane. It's, it's out of my lane. lane. Yeah. I don't do that. But either way, you said real estate was melting down. It's something that you want to talk about hot off the press. Oh, where should we start? I mean, there's all sorts of stuff going on. I was watching, it's funny that I don't use Twitter a lot, but when I do use it, I, I actually kind of enjoy it because it does, Twitter's really good at like the clickbait stuff because you only get so many characters. I don't know how many it is, but you can only say so much and people like Elon Musk, who I follow, he's like, I probably only follow, I don't know, a handful of people. That's why I see all the shit. But so David Sachs, I, I actually follow David Sachs quite a bit because I think he's a smart guy in general and I listen to the All In podcast. Okay. And, who is David Sachs? Is the ho- one of the hosts on All In Podcast. Which if you don't know what the All In Podcast is, you're probably under a rock because it's, I think, one of the number one podcasts going around the world at this point. Literally never listened to it. You no. haven't? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's like, I don't know. I think it's business. Like, I think that's what you'd consider yeah. it. I don't, I don't know if I'd get I don't know what I consider it. I don't listen to it every week. I listen to it, a cherry pick episodes. I've listened to it for probably maybe a year now. I think they only started a couple years ago. Um, but David Sachs, he's he's a widely known guy. I think he was partners or at some executive level with Elon at PayPal when they did that whole deal. Yeah. So knows him. He's also for South Africa. Maybe they're related. I don't know. Anyways, he's pretty cut into the commercial real estate as a tech guy as well for the Silicon Valley area. So he knows kind of what's going on there locally. So he's been like tooting the horn of like commercial real estate probably for like six months. Is like He's like, this place, this is a big problem. Commercial real estate, commercial real estate in the context of like actual commercial assets such as like office towers and big shopping centers and stuff like that. Places that are brick and mortar that don't necessarily have the exact same need as they did even three years ago, especially these office towers that are, you know, half a billion dollars and cannot easily be converted to like residential space. Mm -hmm. So anyways, you know, he's tweeting his normal tweets and then Elon Musk, he's like, I concur. I think his tweet was like word for word. I concur as in the CRE commercial real estate is melting down and residential will follow. See, here's always the problem I have with people like this trying to make claims like that is because he probably lives in San Francisco. People that live in these bubbles, mm, he, he loves to live in Austin then. Anyway, people that live in kind of like Elon these, Musk. I know Elon Musk does. Yeah, I don't know where he lives. Personally, I know he doesn't live in California like full time, yeah, I don't think. But there's always this big thing with these tech guys because they have a lot of money making they these it, yeah. bold proclamations about what's going to happen nationwide when really their only worldview is their own little tiny bubble that is already an anomaly for the rest of the country, right? And yeah. he's saying like, you know, oh, all these $500 million office buildings, you know, all these like malls or whatever. You go to, I bet you that 90% of towns in the United States don't even have a $500 million office building. Like they (laughs) don't have anything even close to that. Like think about Spokane. I will argue that Spokane. What's the most expensive building in Spokane, do you think? Like downtown office building wise? Like like what's the most? Um, It's Wells Fargo building. Probably. probably. It's the biggest building, tallest building. I bet someone could come buy that for like, I don't know, 20 million bucks. I think it'd be a little more than that. I wonder what the tax assessment is. The other story there. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good question. You should look it up. The the other part of the story is, though, is like Spokane notoriously has a very high vacancy rate the last few years since COVID downtown. Mm-hmm. So I think it's like 40 or 60% of offices downtown are vacant. Yeah. 
And guess what? The streets are packed with homeless people. Mm-hmm. So we left the offices and then the homeless people moved in. Yeah, literally describing San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> We're probably describing like, it. Most of the West Coast. Maybe this is a West Coast problem. I don't yeah. know. I mean, I don't know. that. But the thing is as well, we talked about this a little bit last time too, with the West Coast, the thing that we do have going for it is that they are cool places to live, right? Like honestly. Yeah, generally speaking, like, it's uh, nice, nice-ish weather. We don't have too much extremes. We have pretty badass outdoors. Yeah. I mean, if you're in anything with outdoors, you're not going to. Yeah. And as a result, you know, people have moved here and stuff has gotten expensive, right? Like that's, that's how it works. And, and I mean, as well on that same note, right? People are saying all the time that, in fact, someone, someone shared this in our instant investor meeting this morning, that there's this graphic going around that the declining real estate prices is not a nationwide problem. It's strictly a West Coast problem. And they shared this map that, and I'll, I'll put it in the show notes too, but they shared this map that is literally... Is this verified data? Uh, I don't know, probably. I mean, I don't think it's incorrect just looking at, oh, I guess it's it's for, according to Zillow. So verified okay. enough, right? Yeah. And that it is, like all the West Coast states are kind of like red, like the values are going down. And then as you go across the Midwest and down to the Southeast, things are turning green, they're going up in value. They, everyone likes to use that as a political statement, saying people are fleeing the blue states, going to the red states, whatever. What that is, that's an affordability statement. People are leaving, the, especially now with virtual work, people are leaving the places where a three-bed, two-bath house costs them $500,000, and they're moving to the places where it costs them still $150,000. Like some of the main areas where prices are increased, it marks here, plus 10%, like in like Memphis, like some of these Tennessee southern areas. We are buying properties with our business in those markets for like 30 grand Right. They're, they're cheaper, right? They're so much cheaper. And, and people now, if they don't need to be tied to a location, they have virtual work, they're going to be able to live wherever they want. And most people, they want home ownership more so than they care about, you know, moving out west. Because I think that's a big thing is you used to have people that were, you know, born in Ohio, born in Kentucky, whatever, and they would move to the larger metros to go and work the jobs that they just got. Instead, they are staying where they are and they're getting those jobs working remotely, right? And they're able to, you know, stay close to their family and buy more real estate, right? And buy real estate instead of trying to go and figure out how the hell they're going to buy a $1.3 million family home in Seattle. You know, it doesn't make any sense, but. Well, so I guess what I would add to that, just looking at this graphic, because assuming Zillow um, as a private entity is incentivized to publish like clean data that's not swaying anything, because it's percentages, right? So theoretically, going down by a million dollars, a million dollar home going about down by 10% is 100 grand, but in a cheaper market, 10% should still feel like the same swing for the people there. But what what I'm seeing here is, is you're, you're talking like migration. I don't know if there is like actual huge migration. I've heard like some qualitative data, like with like California, where people are like, oh, people are fleeing California, but they are, but there's just as many people moving there. So yeah. there's like a not a net negative migration. So I think what I see, though, is more so these are expensive markets. And some of these are boom and bust markets that are red, like notorious boom and bust markets, right? Like Phoenix area, you have I think Vegas is in here. Seattle's not notoriously boom and bust, but we know the I-5 corridor, Seattle and down into California, they went up a lot because like we were saying earlier, they're great places to live, right? People want, and there's huge job opportunities for people moving here. And so I think because of that, and then also a migration, just like of an immigrant population moving to these areas from outside the U.S., making those areas rise rapidly. Mm -hmm. And with that rapid growth, there has to be some rapid decline, rapid, I'm, you know, doing that in quotations, which feels like, doesn't feel like a large swing to me. I don't know if you're feeling that. Like, I don't feel like, in the residential markets and are in the West Coast, I'm hearing tons of information where people are like, boy, it's a bloodbath out there. I'm still hearing realtors selling deals. Um, I still hear investors flipping houses. And so I, I don't know if that graphic was meant to show something else. The thing is, right, so it's meant to show changes from all-time high, which was a year and a bit ago, which everyone knew was insane. So now we're back at close to where things should be. And also, too, I don't think people like to use that politically as showing people moving away, right? As if, you know, the the property values are directly tied to people leaving the area, which is not true at all. I think it is more so that there is no migration to those areas like there used to be. 
and people are just staying put, right? So now people are buying houses in places that they never would have historically done that because they would look to move somewhere with more opportunity, but they no longer need to do that anymore, right? And then the local population, for example, in Spokane, they are going to start being able to buy houses where they already are from, okay? Prices will come down, more people will try to list their house in the market, less buying power here, whatever. But the point of this whole conversation is that no one knows and people will always try to skew the data in a way that they can either incite fear, of course, get views or project right. some sort of political belief that they want you to believe. That's yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 you know, social media, that's where I say like whoever's posting this or Zillow, I mean, you got to ensure that, see what their incentives are to post something like that. However, I will say the thing that I noticed the most out of this graph is there's absolutely nothing going on in West Texas of importance because <laughs> every single county, if you look at all the counties on this, because I'm assuming these are county maps, is very, very square and like perfectly evenly sized. Where you look at the other parts of the country where you're like, well, there's probably some badass that they carved around here and some politicians negotiated to get like that boat launch into their county or that part of the, <laughs> you know, West Texas is just a bunch <laughs> of square squares. plots of land. <laughs> like literally, that's funny. I mean, and so I so was up going up through Nebraska and a lot of... Yeah, exactly. They're like, there's more cornfields over here and over like, there. That's like it. Iowa. It's literally all just squares on top of each other. <laughs> <laughs> Iowa's a beautiful place this time yeah, of year. Yeah, is it? I don't... Yeah, sorry to our listeners in those flyover from states. From Iowa, yeah. I mean, I guess to wrap up to the conversation on the commercial real estate thing, I do think that there's probably some validity. And if you're looking at it purely from a balance sheet item... But you're absolutely right too. Like some of these like markets where, yeah, not very many markets have big office towers that are going vacant because there's only a handful of office towers, like, you know, those major metros, which tend to recover. I think there are definitely some risks there associated with that in commercial real estate. And I think that brick and mortar continues to to see devastation. You know, there for a while, there was kind of this resurgence of like really cool, even in our in here in Eastern Washington, um, and definitely in all other big metros like resurgence of like small boutique shops moving into some of these commercial spaces and kind of that like shop local, stay local attitude. But I feel like coming out of COVID, a lot of that is kind of like left. And and some of that shop local, buy local has moved like Etsy. For, and there's people killing it on Etsy, but that's virtual. They don't have a shop. I also know that you have young kids, you don't get out much because downtown Spokane's popping with all that sort of stuff right now. <laughs> I don't think it is, Dude, though. I, like, when was where the, it used when to was be. the last time he went out anywhere? <laughs> I was just down there for lunch. Come on. It's like 20 minutes from my house. But yeah, sure. There's, so there's bars, yeah. right? There's bars and actually quite a few restaurants. But those are like low margin businesses, honestly. Like they're not, they're, they're going to barely pay their rent, you know? And, and the thing about bars and restaurants is every three to five years, they have to go through a branding cycle or they have to close their doors. Because, and you even look at some of the best restaurants in Spokane or what I've thought were best, like they've had to rebrand or leave or whatever. The owners are still doing stuff, but like just that cycle, that business, it's not necessarily a high quality business that you want. That's going to be an anchor tenant within your business of shops. For sure. I mean, it creates culture for the area, but it's not going to be, you know, an anchor tenant for like a large right. commercial real estate building. But Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I don't know. That's just kind of my thoughts. That's my feeling. Of course, that's just a feeling. It's opinion. Yeah. It's been coming for a while. I mean, people have been talking about how malls have been dying since... Amazon started to explode, right? Have you been to our mall recently? I have not. I've been, I've been to Riverside, uh, Riverside Mall. Well, downtown, downtown yeah, that's a little different nice. vibe. Yeah, North Town, I'm sure, yeah. is really depressing. Yeah, I go to the trampoline park once in a while. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I don't know, and then that's that, and then the multifamily space is a whole other thing altogether. Like right now, I should find the exact article, Aaron and Muscatchi sent it to me on Facebook, and um, he said that it was basically saying that of all of the foreclosures, I forget the exact number, it was an insane amount was multifamily assets of like all real estate foreclosures going on in the United States mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. And it's tied mainly to two things. One is to bad actors in the space who learned how to syndicate and abuse the uh, system, what? right? Yeah. And the, the, of yeah. course, the scapegoat guy that they use, I say scapegoat, he actually was a scumbag based on the, what was being posted, but he started doing multifamily real estate in 2020 bought 500 million worth of assets with his fund in like three years and is now losing literally all of them to foreclosure. But they went through and like, he was a nationality, he was an Indian, okay? He had a medical background and he had his whole thing that he marketed towards other people of Indian descent that were in the medical field. So oh. he immediately has huge credibility, right? Which is mm -hmm. real shady. 
and how <laughs> we went through like his documents and he had it written in where he received between four to six percent of all of the money raised as basically his like fee. So he made like stupid money, right? Doing all this. Jesus. Had no intention of ever doing anything with the properties. Literally some of them he bought and never even made the first loan payment. So he just, he was just raising capital to get that money yeah. out, extort. Yeah, at least he bought assets. Like well, this. I mean, you have to be able to show it. And yeah. then he just would collapse the whole thing. So that was, that was kind of like the extreme example. But going further into the article, they're talking about how the huge number of people that were buying um, those kind of assets in 2020 and 2021 with revolving interest rates. And a lot of them were like three years, right? And so all the 2020 people, they're coming up right now and their interest rates yep. that were at 3% are going to be coming in at seven. And they're going to be yep. changing every single year after that. If they can't sustain that additional cost, they're going to be in big trouble. And they're going to be a bunch more that come in 2024, more in 2025. And then from there, it should start to catch up again because people will have been acquiring things at those higher rates already. At those, yeah. But it's going to cause huge issues with that asset class. And this goes back to an episode a while, I don't know, three or four weeks ago, maybe longer than that. Where I'm like, I do not understand the exit for these multifamily people. Where is your buyer? Yeah. You don't have a buyer, mm -hmm. you know, and they're completely screwed. Yeah, you're absolutely challenging. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's completely challenging. You layer that on with, I mean, I know people that were syndicating this, those last few years, I had no idea what they're doing that are also bankrupt, mm -hmm. you know. There's a lot of people out there that were all of a sudden syndicators, which is just this, I don't, I'm not going to share my opinion on that right now. I think everybody knows what that is. But the other stuff they're doing just to get these deals done. So here's, here's a challenge with those types of folks is, is they're, they're sometimes are raising capital from other people that they know or from people they don't know. But if they get this capital, now they got to make the deal happen. Mm -hmm. They might even get a LOI out, find the deal and say, okay, now we're going to raise our capital. Now they have this money sitting there. They have this need to spend it. Then they're getting these bridge loans and this mezzanine debt, this basically additional debt against the property just to make the deal go through. And guess what? That bridge loan is, you know, 12 months, mm -hmm. it's coming due in this crazy environment, all the other additional debt and crap that you're just throwing on there to try to get this deal done just to invest money. Because, yeah, you're getting a lot of these guys are, you know, they're getting an asset management fee, you know, 1%, 2%. They're getting an acquisition fee of 1% to 2%, you know, and so they're like, they're incentivized to make these deals go mm -hmm. through with, with whatever they have yeah. to do. And at every turn, if they're like, well, we can just kind of tack on, we can slap on this additional little debt here to get us across this finish line here. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. And the investors are no wiser. They don't yeah. know because they're friends and family or they're trusted. They're like, yeah, like you said, you're you're from a very niche group like doctors. Um, notoriously, there's a lot of uh, doctors out there that end up creating syndication funds, good and bad. I don't know any of them that are bad personally, but like that creates credibility within the medical community that, hey, this is one of ours. Pilots, same thing, <laughs> because you'll see pilots out there that are become syndicators and they're automatically trusted within the pilot community. You have these communities of, of like-minded people and same types of people that automatically give trust to a person because they passed a similar threshold of life, whether that's a degree or a certification or whatever. Yeah. It's, that should happen. Totally. You see it everywhere. I mean, you've sat with GoBundance that we're both involved in, right? Like those are, yeah. those are the easiest sales for people. It's like, oh, you're a GoBundance guy? Yeah, sure. Let's, you know, I'll just go past all the yeah, part where I underwrite trust. you. Yeah. Um, and as a result, there's been bad actors in there yeah. in the past, right? And I don't know, it, it's, it's just really interesting to sort of see. And I think that that is the unspoken risk of those larger assets that when people don't know what they're doing and they're trying to jump into them and they're trying to just like make a deal because they, like you said, they need to because they've raised some money and they have like all this like, pledged funds they need to figure out what to do with and these different yeah. things. Ultimately though, I think that it's just, that's why it's so important to learn how to actually run analysis and to know how to actually hunt and find your own deals. Because mm -hmm. at the end of it, even if you buy a bad deal, like or kind of a whatever deal, but at least you bought it at a discount, you're not going to be as bad as if you're buying it retail and you're trying to like squeeze some extra stuff out of it. Absolutely. And the number one, like the prettiest girl in the room is the guy or gal that knows how to find a mm -hmm. deal and source a deal. doesn't matter what other skills you have. If you can bring a deal to the table and it's an actual deal because you knew how to market to it, you knew how to sell it, you knew, how to, you, know, you, knew, you knew how to get under contract, you knew how to do all those steps to find and secure a property, money comes, expertise comes, all the other stuff comes. And so building that skill, I mean, that's kind of what we've done in our business. Well, it is what we've done in our business. And that's like the number one skill I think you can have in this industry. Yeah. 
finding good deals. Yeah, and for some reason, it's always the one that gets pushed by the, by the wayside, you know? Right. Talk to so many people who have these large multifamily sort of ambitions and they always start doing things like, oh, well, what if I start with like a property management company? So I know how to manage it mm-hmm. when I find that thing. Oh, what if I right. started a construction company so I can save on the renovation costs when I ultimately find that multifamily property yeah. I'm going to buy? It's like you're putting the car before the horse. Just find the multifamily first yeah. and hire each of those out because I'll tell you what, none of that sounds interesting I to know, me. But, that, uh, but that's what people do. Owning a good asset sounds good, yeah. but not all the other crap. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting. And, and also too, that's the greatest way to hedge against any sort of market shift. Is if you're if you're bought things at a discount, the market drops thirty percent, but you buy for thirty percent off. Cool, you're at zero. Yep. You know, and everyone else is underwater at that point, so you're you're doing pretty good. Right. Yeah. the The market as a whole, who knows? I think that just learn, focusing on the skill set. You know, my my thought is whenever there's kind of questions in the market or just around like the economy in general, it's when it's so important just to focus on your own skills and your own knowledge base right. as opposed to like trying to make big moves. I mean, how many people have we talked to of the last little bit that are have decided like, I'm just trying to hold as much cash as I possibly can right now because I don't know. That is what wealthy yeah. people do. Yeah. Like, you know, they get away from this Dave Ramsey bullshit of like, I need to invest X amount every single month. Instead, it's like, or we could just like wait and see what happens because I have enough yep. skill set and enough of like a long-term vision that if I don't invest for an entire year, that's fine. Because at least I will have like saved that and I'm not gonna miss out because I am actively doing things to create more opportunity or to figure out how to create more opportunity. That's where like the real growth is going to come from, not just from like throwing things in the market blindly and doing dollar cost averaging, which is honestly kind of a farce that the stock market sales machine sells you. But now they're incentivized, right? Of course they are, yeah. I think you got to look at what people are incentivized to do. Yeah, <laughs> your advisor is incentivized to have more wealth under management mm-hmm. because they get a percentage of that. Yeah. Uh, Stockbrokers incentivized to broker stocks. <laughs> right? So when the market's down, they still need money. Yeah. So you should invest yours. Buy, buy low, so Ex- high. Yeah, exactly. But then, <laughs> but then when you sell, maybe that's even the whole thing with the uh, the Wolf of Wall Street, isn't it? They're like, oh, and then when you know they just bought Disney for. What did they say? When you bought Disney for 60 and I take you out for 110, are you going to tell me that you don't want to go into HP for 85 so I can take you out again at 120? Like there's like the whole sales <laughs> pitch that they have with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, they get yeah, like, yeah. I mean, I don't know if they still do like that in brokers anymore, but in that movie, they get commissions based on the trades, right? So yeah. like they're strongly incentivized to retrade you over and over again. I have no idea if that's still valid at all. I don't know how that space has changed, but I'm sure it's not the same as it was back then. Yeah, well, a lot of folks will catch you, like the wealth advisors and stuff that work for these big companies because they do they do pitch like mutual funds that they get a fee yeah. for selling that. And and so you just got to be careful with that stuff. I've bought mutual funds from, that's how I learned how it works from a wealth advisor. And I realized that I had to pay a fat fee up front. Yeah. And then the one that he pitched me was shit. And I didn't make any money for three years on it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that that sucks. I mean, I, I, I will say the equivalent of that, though, that we have in the real estate space is wholesalers and realtors, right? Like The equivalent to, yeah. Totally, right? Like if you are looking to buy a property, even if you're using a realtor on the MLS. Dude, you can make so much money on this one. It's 20K. How many times have people been yeah. like, dude, it's only a 20K rehab, and I'm looking at them like, bro, I think it's like a 60K like rehab. all the time. And then and realtors will post that on like the Facebook groups, yeah. like, oh, $20,000 rehab. Move this wall. I'm like, the house doesn't even have electrical. What are you talking about? Twenty thousand dollar rehab. Yeah, where's the foundation? Yeah, exactly. Just dumb stuff. But I mean, even if it's someone that you're directly working with, this will happen. Is you know the realtor has a conversation on the back end with the other realtor, and the selling agent is like, "Hey, look, they just like really want to get this done." And your buyer's agent comes back and goes, "Okay, so how about if you know we negotiate with them this way? You just like let the roof go. Like I have a roofing guy I'll connect you with. He's really competitive. Like he will make sure that it gets done <laughs> because he's not getting paid either. Yeah. Like sure, he it can be your best friend. It can be your hairdresser. It can be yeah. your cousin's neighbors, whatever. I don't know, whoever people get the realtors from. Yeah. But they're not getting paid until you close the deal. So they just want you to get it done. Anybody that gets paid on a transaction, you should know that they're incentivized to make that transaction yeah, happen. absolutely. You know, even like, even this is funny. So like, we're selling one of our buildings. We actually have a commercial broker on it. And I love how every time I get the chirp in from like the senior broker, like great clean offer. Good job. This is a good one. It's like, I'll be the determiner. I'll determine that. Like, this is a great, it's like, no, you don't need to 
coaching me up. Like, I'm going to look at it for what it is. Yeah. Like, I'm, I know what I'm doing here. And it's like, he should know that. Come on, like, quit trying to sell me on this transaction. Yeah, and uh, so basically, yeah, what happens is, yeah, we got an offer today and they sent it over and we're working with the agent and the, it's the designated broker that always immediately comments and like tries to give it like a good praise. But he's now done this like eight times as your reviews, eight offers. Yeah, and you're like, you didn't even look at it because his last offer was shit. Yeah. And then I'll respond back. I'm like, like the one, remember the one we got from the Pace Morby door, yeah. whatever that was, the the whole like, I couldn't even understand the offer. Like we, three of us sat there and read it. I could not figure yeah. it out. And uh, I just said, hey, I can't understand this offer. So that means I'm I'm out. She finally responds. She's like, yeah, I thought it was kind of complicated. I'm like, then why didn't you say I that? Like, what? You don't just like think that like, well, maybe he'll say yes and I'll make, you know, whatever amount of money. That's it. The real estate game works, right? And that's why, and that's why, that's why they get flagged. That's also why if you find good ones, they're worth their weight in gold. 100%. Because yeah. they're hard to find. There's very few of them. You know, and I do think that that'll kind of change around in the real estate space as more and more, I don't say like amateurs, but like small time investors are becoming more educated on the real estate process in general. Because like a lot of those people, especially when it comes to sort of commercial assets like this, the brokers are used to all of their clients just being like old guys that bought the properties in like the 80s. And they're like, I don't know what this shit means. Like, should I accept this? Sure. And they're just like, yes, because I want to make my, you know, $18,000 commission. Oh, yeah. From the investor standpoint. Yeah. yeah from, or from the investor spectrum perspective. Yeah. Because I was going to say, there's still surprisingly a lot of people out there that don't know how to even look at a piece of a property totally. from a personal ownership standpoint. Oh, for sure. Right. Yeah. But I mean, it was definitely more than it was 10 years ago. Yeah, there's a lot more education around it. It's a lot more easily accessible mm -hmm. too. Yeah, absolutely. And then not only that, it's a lot more interest. You know, there's a lot of like younger people that are wanting to get into it because they recognize the financial freedom that can come with real estate, right? But whereas I feel like not that long ago, the only people that owned rental properties were kind of like slumlords who were just like, eh, I don't know. Right. I like, I have a, <laughs> could, like whatever roofing company I need to like place money somewhere and I don't give a shit about these. You kind of wonder how some of those old guys we do buy these from, like, how do they ever think about getting into real estate? Because I'm like, I don't know that you really know, like, what you're no. doing. Actually, I know you don't know what you're doing. Like, why are you owning properties? This is something I have always thought about, especially when we meet some of these old dudes and we're like, you know, we're buying their properties from them at this point because they're heavily distressed. I'm just like, how did you buy this in the first place? Like, yeah. you don't know how to do an email. You yeah. can't do a yeah, DocuSign. It's like, no e sign. Yeah, it's like, and I'm meeting you at the bar at 11 a.m. on Tuesday to sign the document. Yeah. Like, like <laughs> how did you buy this? And you, yeah, you, gotta and you own how many? 18 of them? Are you serious? Like, <laughs> it's like, what is that? I don't know. I've never figured yeah. it out. You know, and it's not just that the property was that much cheaper that long ago. I mean, it was, but these people obviously weren't raking it in. No, obviously not, because they're 18 properties and they're still going into bankruptcy. Yeah, right. <laughs> but also all of their properties are like, one third of market rent. It's like, wow, I could fix this problem for yeah, you. Yeah, no shit, right? But they're like, oh, but she's great. It's like, she's your ex-wife. Like, <laughs> it's surprising how many people we've looked at houses where their ex-wife lives A there lot. in the house or the apartment. Yeah, like way too many. Yeah. And then we're, we go to walk the house and like the actual wife like shows up just to make sure that the landlord doesn't get too buddy-buddy with the ex-wife. <laughs> Did happen for me. We've guys. had a couple of those. I think, what, two maybe? Two or three? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Focus on the skill set. Focus on the business side. I think it's another thing too is if you're a smaller investor trying to figure out really treating it like a business probably earlier than you needed to five or six years ago. Actually having like a general system, actually like knowing how to run analysis and not just like throwing things into the wind and hoping that it works out. Like those times are gone, unfortunately. They're not yeah, it's just a lot more uh, formalized, a lot more professionalized. Mm -hmm out there. Yeah. You got to step up if you're going to be in the game. Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with that. No. I would also say it's also easier to get into the game than it used to be because there's so many services out there. I mean, if you want to market, right, you can find, you can find people that can run SMS for you or direct mail. Hell, you can, you know, work with us and we'll like do the whole system for you. Right. Like there's, and right. there's so many different iterations of that out there now from various capacities. Well, even the tools that we use from when we first started, how more advanced they've gotten and how much easier it is to use those tools versus when it was first coming out, you know. There's just definitely so much better to be operating now than it was even three or four years mm -hmm. ago. Like it's, you can just go on, you can like learn all this stuff. Yeah. You know, I always talk about this, like you can't, it's not like you can't learn it. And if you're willing to invest in yourself, you can do this business quite easily. The biggest problem 
I see is people aren't willing to invest in themselves. They get nervous when they're having to invest, even if it's $100 a month or $200 a month for a CRM or spending a little extra money on real marketing and actually, you know, getting out there and being consistent. But the other thing is people aren't willing to wait, but they're not willing to get their pay to get there faster. Yeah. Like you can, like you said, you can sign up for our service. We can get you there way faster than if you started your own business, mm-hmm. whatever, that's fine. Or we can show you how to do it. Like you and I have learned and paid people to go faster, but other people just, those are the two things that I see people not willing to make yeah. the leap into this industry for. I know. And it's funny. People always, they want to cut on the small things too, mm-hmm. which I think is funny. I mean, even today on our, on our coaching call, they were talking, there's one of our guys who's just closed a bunch of deals and made some really solid money. And now it comes down to, it's like, well, it's like, I need to figure out how I'm going to carry the cost of like a lead manager, like an overseas lead manager, mm-hmm. which is going to be 800 to $1,000 a month. And it's like, well, if you look at it over the course of the year, right, it's 9,600 to twelve thousand dollars if they get you one deal that'll pay for it Mm -hmm. if they don't get you a deal in like the next three months or they don't help you out they need to fire them at that point so it's relatively low risk okay absolutely like in like that's with anything that you know there's things that you and i have spent money on where it's like you're spending money you're like oh i don't want to spend money on this and then boom you pop off a deal that pays for that entire year's worth of marketing or whatever it is and that inevitably happens and same thing goes like when you actually get a big pay bump, like you get a big fat $20,000, $30,000, $50,000 fee. If you look at your burn rate, go say, okay, here's my burn rate. Maybe it's $5,000 a month. I just paid for 10 months of my business operating. I can take some risks. Mm -hmm. I can take two months worth of risk, three months worth of risk, and I'm still going to have seven or eight months worth of burn. If I do nothing else, Mm -hmm. if I make zero money, and if you figured out how to get from point A to point B and get your first wholesale fee or do your first flip or buy your first rental property and actually cash flow on it, like you've done what 99.9% of people can't do. You've already proven you can do it. Now you just have to do it again. Yeah, It's doable to do it again. Yeah. And after a point, you have to bet on yourself. You know, like, mm-hmm. like people are so eager to throw money into, you know, stocks or a rental property or they have like a friend that has like the next greatest business idea. And they're like, oh, I'll sure I'll give you twenty thousand dollars to help you launch that, and you're gonna th- you're gonna three x my money in five years. That's amazing. Or instead, just make yourself that startup company, invest in that like right now, and a thousand extra money in the next three years. There you go, and be full in control of it, and don't believe like that the system's gonna work. But people people will do the investment much quicker than they'll ever bet on themselves, and it's really. Yeah. I don't know what that is. They'll invest in other people with very, very little knowledge about those other people or what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it comes down to fear. They don't know what they don't know. Well, it's fear of what's not the average, what's not normal. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really what it comes down to on a lot of this stuff. Everybody's like, it's ingrained in everybody's head. You know, our parents, this is how like our parents' generation made their wealth was like, well, just invest in the stock market. You just give somebody your money Mm -hmm. and they'll make sure, you know, it's taken care of. Put in your 401k. What a great investment. You know, not. Really, really, when you actually peel the onion back, you know, so there is so to go from that to I'm actually now going to run my own investments, mm-hmm. meaning I'm going to invest in real estate or maybe you're investing in, in some private equity or maybe you're investing as an LP in some syndications like that is a stray from the norm, but it's normal for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. So think about it that way. Like it's just a different grouping of people that you're associating with. It's like a different culture. It's just not the one that gets talked about in school and um. Exactly. That most people's parents grew up with. But you know who talks about it a lot? Rich people. Rich people. That's right. I mean, and that's honestly, that is a separation of uh, like social classes right there. That is kind of like the separation if you look at it at its core. You know, that's why you see all those in those stupid infographics that go around on Instagram that are like, oh, this is how rich people look at money versus how poor people look at money. <laughs> I hate that shit, by the way. It's so dumb. Yeah. <laughs> they're usually pretty simplistic. They're, they're simple so simplistic. Infographics, but... You know, they motivate people. And you're always like, this is posted by a guy from India, 46731, who's just like trying to get a bunch <laughs> of likes so he can monetize his Instagram profile. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Oh my God. Anyway, moral of the story, focus on skills, learn to find discounted assets. And if you learn how to find anything in discount, you'll be the coolest person in the room, no matter where you go. So there we go. I said prettiest. Yeah, I was trying to make it more like, gender neutral 2023 just trying to stay up with the time boys can't be pretty is are you assuming i i am it's a feminine word yep okay. <laughs> i guess we're back on myself there boom so. <laughs> anyways all right guys well thanks for listening we will sign off here you should go check out collecting keys podcast.com slash free and get our free five-step guide so generating off-market leads so you can find all these discounted assets so we just spent the last 20 minutes talking about it's really not as hard as you think 
but give you a great little layout there and get you started in as quick as two weeks if you really want to. So collectingkeyspodcast.com slash free. You get that. If you're clicking around, you'll probably find our store too and you might find a new piece of clothing for your wardrobe. I know, I know. I, I got to get on my wife to get some more shirts together. She's. I was going to ask you, do we get any more designs for our store at Click the Keys? We need to. This is, Click the Keys this is like the, the bane of, you know, being married to a graphic designer is she's very talented and she's very, very good when she does put stuff very, together. Very, very talented. And she's extremely offended if I hire somebody else, but also just because we're married, she has no respect for my time or timelines. So exactly. <laughs> just, yeah. <laughs> There you go. That's the truth right there. Yeah, that's... But she is highly talented. Yeah. So, you know, I've been like, hey, it's been like two months. And she was like, yeah, I'll get to it. She's even sent drafts of stuff. I'm like, cool. So can I use that? No. Nope. Can you finalize yeah, that? So, <laughs> no. Anyway. So, yeah. Go to the, check out the store. Gratikispodcast.com slash store. And you should got some stuff there too. So anyways, guys, thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you all next week. See ya. See ya.